Hi everybody. So, this is the asynchronous video to show you how to do the methods section um, of your presentation. So, <clears throat> let's go ahead and get started. The first thing that you're going to need is the assignment sheet itself. The methods section that you'll be filling out as we go is on page three. You can pause me while you go get that. Cool, we're back. All right, so um, as we go, I want you to think about your painting and the methods used. Methods is really about how the artist put the painting together. The basic information talks about who made this, where it's from, the size, and themes and symbols and meanings. Well, that's what it's about. Methods, though, is literally how did the artist design this painting? How did they create it in order to, well, get their point across? So, <clears throat> let's talk about some methods of Renaissance art. One of the major changes in Renaissance art was a sudden focus on landscapes. Um, before this, paintings were of mostly like God or specific animals or, you know, kings and queens. But in particular in the Northern Renaissance, we start to see a focus on large outdoor scenes. So let's take a look at this landscape. This landscape is a really good example of dividing space. So what do I mean by dividing space? So if you look at this painting, you can see that right along, oops, that right along the middle, um, there's a horizon line that divides the painting pretty neatly um, from the top, from the top third to the top bottom two thirds. There's also this secondary line that kind of comes across like that, right? What that helps to do is to delineate the space cutting it into like three sections of the painting. This gives more depth and also provides emphasis on various elements inside of the painting. There's also a solid dividing line here with, you know, this large dark tree. <clears throat> Other elements are the people inside of the painting, um, give it an air of, life and movement. And the biggest chunk of landscape is when you're sitting someone for a portrait, like I am a portrait right now, there's not a lot of depth behind them usually. Landscapes though do need to really pull out that depth to give a sense of realism. Another method used in the Renaissance, in particular in the Northern Renaissance, is an extreme attention to detail. Differently than the Southern Renaissance, which had these light and airy scenes with, <clears throat> with very idealized people, the Northern Renaissance instead really finds its way into the small details of its subject matter. In the Arnolfini portrait, you can see all kinds of tiny details. You can see the shadows behind the shoes, the wood paneling in the floor, the individual folds uh, in the bride's dress, the hairs on the tiny dog. Remember, with a painting, someone has to do that. Everything is here on purpose. You can't photobomb a painting. Let's take a look at the background of the Arnolfini portrait. You can see behind the bride and the groom that there's a mirror here, and you can see them um, as two figures there. You can also see the individual lattice work and cutouts on the chandelier. All of the fabric in the background has folds. The shadows from the window come in at a certain angle. You can even see the eyelets in, um, in the bride's lace. Let's keep going. This is the background of the Arnolfini portrait itself. As you zoom in on the mirror, you can see that the artist has actually done something very clever. Uh, Johannes van Eyck, uh, 
is the artist, and it says Johannes van Eyck was here, um, as if it was graffiti on the wall, but it's actually the artist's signature very cleverly with the date. Further, as you look into the mirror, and this is all, by the way, relatively small on the work itself, if you look up the work, one of the reasons that we always ask you to find out the size of the painting is that the Arnolfini portrait is not specifically large. Um, it's maybe like, yay. But you can see the back of the bride and the groom. You can see the figure in blue and the figure in red. The figure in red is actually the artist himself. Um, the figure in blue is the priest. So, the painting shows the bride, the groom, the priest, and the artist. Even more, even tinier, you can actually see there are scenes from the life of Jesus around the mirror itself. Um, here on the right, beginning with his birth, um, going all the way around as many miracles until his eventual crucifixion. You can see the amber beads just to the left of the mirror. <clears throat> they reflect individual pieces of light. The small broom here has bristles on it, and this is what we mean when we say that extreme attention to detail. Part of this is, well, artists showing off that they have a new method of painting. Uh, oil paints had really just come to this part of Europe, and, well, artists were very excited to go and work in this new medium. Okay, one of the other things that comes in, especially when we talk about Renaissance art, is anatomical study. So before this, <clears throat> um, there were strong prohibitions by the church and society on, um, well, studying cadavers, actually. However, Michelangelo was known to, well, study uh, bodies in order to get their anatomical structures together. Um, the detail paid to just the human form is definitely one of the methods and techniques used in the Renaissance more than in the Middle Ages. Now then, this is from the Sistine Chapel. This is Southern Renaissance, but honestly, I couldn't figure out a better, like, more obvious example of um, that extreme anatomical study, right? Making people that have all of the muscles in the right place, that have their jaws just so, that aren't um, highly stylized, um, like paintings from the Middle Ages were. And instead, we're much more realistic. One of the other chunks that comes in is the idea of grotesquerie. What if you took that extreme attention to detail and also your anatomical study and then just turned it up to 11 until it was grotesque? So instead of these hyper-idealized people, um, the grotesquerie was born. Uh, this painting is not only fantastic, uh, a little bit funny, but it's a really great example of grotesquerie. So... Unlike the Italian Renaissance, things don't have to be like specifically idealized, but they should be interesting to look at. Here is another example of, um, of a grotesquerie. <clears throat> I don't... No, that one is not Lucas Cronick. But, again, we see these unidealized people, right? Um, the sparse chin strap beard, the missing teeth the crooked fingers. Some of the paintings that um, we'll give you to analyze include that. Okay, let's go to portrait skills. So, another idea that begins to show up is the idea that when making a portrait of someone, you shouldn't attempt to um, idealize their form so much that you might lose the actual person and how they actually looked. This is an excellent example. So this is 
a portrait of Henry VIII. You, you all remember him from killing a bunch of his wives. You remember he had six wives. First one was divorced. The second one was beheaded. The third one died. Uh, the fourth one was divorced. The fifth one was beheaded. And the sixth one survived. So that's fun. Divorced, beheaded, died. Divorced, beheaded, survives. All right. But let's take a look at Henry here. So the mood and the obvious gravitas of this painting is just that Henry is not beautiful. He is not soft. He might not even be a good person, but everything about this painting tells me that he is a powerful person. The shoulders fill up the entire portrait. He's pictured larger than life and up. And yeah, he still has these like beady little pig eyes and this little nose, right? He's not a beautiful man, but he is obviously a powerful one, right? He is pictured in all of his kingly regalia, right? The, you know, the grand necklaces of state, the, um, the perfect silks and chemises pulled through. By the way, that's um, the, the little white spots. Like literally that is an undershirt that has to be pulled through buttonholes in order to do that in every spot, right? It showcases the amount of work it takes to dress this man, right? Someone has to do that for you. This is a powerful man. Everything about the painting is trying to tell you that. And earlier I mentioned the rule of threes. Um, it's an idea in art where Paintings are split up into thirds, uh, vertically and horizontally. And here you can see this painting is an excellent example of that. The top third line is Henry's shoulders. The middle two thirds lines are done easily by that grand coat, the, you know, those big royal robes. The bottom third line is his belt line, <clears throat> right, where he sits with his sword staring at you. It moves, it helps to move the viewer's eye around the painting so they notice all of the things and also establish like, well, what the subject of the piece is. All right, moving on. One of the other grand hallmarks of the Renaissance, and in particular the Northern Renaissance, is that the Northern Renaissance, these Baroque painters showed off the lives of peasants. In your reading, uh, you guys have seen the peasants' wedding before, which will help a little as we go and walk through some of the elements of this painting. So in this painting, there's a lot going on, right? And no one figure in this painting is the subject, you know, the subject, right? It's much more spread out. There's also this sense of movement, right? The, <clears throat> the red in the painting, let's talk about color and movement. The red in the painting draws the viewer's eye from the top left corner down to the bagpiper, here to the kid in the silly hat, uh, you know, eating the pie with his hands, um, to the brothers, likely, of the bride, uh, serving all of these pies, oh, oops, serving all of these pies and walking about themselves. These people are shown in, in mid, like mid-step, right? Always a little bit off balance because your mind knows where the next step would go and this, gives the painting a sense of movement and life. <clears throat> you can, and this painting is pretty fantastic. The way that it's done, you can almost hear the music of the pipers. You can really like feel that there's conversation in the room and things are happening. In fact, I would say really the only person that looks still and calm and quiet in the entire painting is, well, the bride sitting here um, underneath the held up crown um, in front of <clears throat> this black background. There are a lot of like interesting symbols in this painting as well, like 
we've talked about, you know, symbolism and, um, and theme before. As you look at this piece, you'll see some pretty solid symbols, like everyone's eating, it, you know, it shows that there's like, there's abundance. These people's lives are simple, but they are not scant. There is grain on the wall, right? You know, this obvious symbol of fertility and prosperity. The crown held above her head on string. Well, the floating crowns in eras before this are usually a mark of divinity. The Virgin Mary is often pictured with that sort of floating crown. <clears throat> All right, last jump. Okay, move myself off the painting. Uh, this is another Van Eyck. It's called the Chancellor Ronan and the, Vir you know, and the Virgin Mary. So in this painting, we see the Virgin Mary on the right holding Jesus with an angel above her head. On the left, we see Chancellor Ronan. What I'd like you to do is go ahead and Pause this video for just a second and see if you can, or what symbols, what methods in the painting that divide up the space, show the colors, set the mood, right? How is the artist, like, how is the artist making this happen? How did they put the lines together to make theme and mood obvious? Oh, wait. Did you pause me yet? And we're back. All right, so now that you're back from your pause, let's go ahead and, well, first of all, let's talk about the lines. This painting as well also has the, um, the third lines running through it. The tops of the heads of the two main figures make up the top third. Their laps rather make up the bottom third. Well, her lap, his um, prayer kneel, the vertical thirds are built by these columns and even carried out further by the very well done tile floor. In order to make, um, to set the mood, the artist has um, rendered both of their faces. Like the Virgin Mary here looks, well, honestly quite aloof. Like she really doesn't care what this chancellor is saying. Whereas he's looking at her, you know, very supplicant, very, very in prayer, right? With his big book and his lavish robes in this gorgeous room. He's meant to be shown very wealthy and that really comes across. He lives in this vast and grand city. There's another method in here, like it is an interior space, but that landscape in the background has quite a bit of depth. The artist, show, you know, making that depth happen by putting a garden in the, uh, like just behind the room and putting people just on this balcony and then the river, the bridge, the boat. Remember, I mean, paintings are flat. How is depth happening? The artist is making that happen by what they've chosen to include. So, that's pretty much the end of me. That way, that's not your homework. Um, that's pretty much the end of me. <clears throat> Things to remember while you go through your own painting and look for those methods is everything in a painting happens on purpose, right? Nothing is a coincidence. The artist is doing all of that. So when you fill out the methods section, think about how are they using color? How are they using lights? How are they using these shapes and these lines? How, yeah, how are they using that to convey their message? All right, kiddos, good luck, and I'll see you later.